Welcome to our discussion series on ethical schools of thought. We have covered Aristotle, Confucius, Hinduism, Judaism, Kant, Adam Smith, civil rights, nonviolence, Zoroaster, and now Christianity. Next up is Lucretius. Books and Bridges is a humanities institute of ideas and conversation. We explore the wisdoms of the world and apply them to modern life. Whether through literature, philosophy, or history, we promote searching, sincere dialogue across the human spectrum and value the beauty and depth it brings to our public interactions. This is Christian Holy Week. Some 2000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth walked the dusty plains of Judea, gathering disciples, teaching, healing, resisting power and promising a coming kingdom of God. This vision of a new society exemplified radical self-sacrifice and the good news of life after death opened up the time-bound reckoning of the philosophers. Christianity arose at a time of devouring empire, but appealed to the finer, more lasting hungers of the human heart. As part of our ethics series, we delve into the call and ordering of love. Here to guide us through the mystery is James K.A. Smith, one of society's most profound and yet most hip and cool, if you ask me, philosophical voices. Dr. Smith is professor of philosophy at Calvin University and serves as editor in chief of Image Journal, a quarterly devoted to art, mystery, and faith. Trained as a philosopher with a focus on contemporary French thought, Smith has, ex has expanded on that scholarly platform to become an engaged public intellectual and cultural critic. An award-winning author and widely traveled speaker, he has emerged as a thought leader with a unique gift of translation building bridges between the academy, society, and the church. James K. Smith, take it away. Thank you for being with us. Thanks so much, Nathan. Thanks for the opportunity. It's, uh, it's great to be with you. I, I absolutely love what you're doing here, which is convening people around sort of lifelong liberal arts learning. It's like, may your tribe increase. I, I absolutely love it and i love the um the assignment you've given me tonight it was it's it was um when when nathan reached out and asked if i could talk about a framework for christian ethics i think he also realized how daunting it was to sort of say oh give me uh, christian ethics in 30 minutes and i was like okay but i'm up for the challenge and for me it's it's an interesting exercise let me tell you how i'm coming at this i i want to take 30 minutes to try to articulate a framework for christian ethics that um, I'm trying to highlight what is distinctive about a Christian ethic, and especially I would say the biblical exemplar of Jesus, which is also why it's, it seems quite fitting to be uh, considering this during Holy Week or the week of what we call sometimes Christ's passion, his suffering uh, on behalf of humanity. But I'm doing this in a way that um, I, I am a Christian, but I don't want to assume that all of you are or that you agree with this or believe this. I, instead, think of it as, I, I, as a Christian, I'm trying to articulate what I think are the sort of um, the kernels, the core, the, the framework, the spine of a Christian ethic, but I hope in a way that uh, um, is a fresh way of, of framing that. The other thing I guess I should say is I am trying to articulate a Christian ethic in a way I, I guess I want to recognize that it may deconstruct some of the sort of public morality we see from too many people who call themselves Christians in the United States. I, I hope you understand what I'm saying there. In other words, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to articulate what is to me sort of the biblical ideal of a Christian ethic. I don't claim that this is a descriptive account of how Christians behave. Uh, this is this could be perhaps aspirational in that regard. And what I want to do is, you can gather from the title, is I, I I'm convinced and convicted that the ordering principle of a Christian ethic has to be love. But I, what I want to try to show is that doesn't just mean kind of a milk toast hallmark. Uh, let's you know be warm and fuzzy to one another. I think I think actually an ethic of love has more teeth than that. Uh, I think it, there's something meaningful about it, and so I, I'm going to try to tease this out. I'm, I, I'll give you the here's the trailer. I want to talk about love as devotion, 
Then I want to talk about the law of love as the ordering of our affections. That's where we'll get at the heart of this idea of ordering our loves in the title. But then I also want to talk about love as a habit, which is why I think a Christian ethic is a virtue ethic. It sounds like some of you have been talking about Aristotle. You'll see some overlap between that. And then finally, I want to talk about why a Christian ethic is a cruciform ethic, why love finds its expression in sacrifice and, and service for others. So does that sound like a plan going forward? That sounds so excellent. Start. Great, great. Let me start with um, this theme of what the reason why I think love is the core and center of a Christian ethic is um, because love is a mode of devotion. And what I want to do is I do want to sort of show you how this is reflected in the scriptures, which Christians take to be authoritative and, and, and articulating this. And so you're going to, if you'll bear with an old philosopher trying to operate technology. Uh, I want to, um, here's a kind of key core focal text. This is Jesus speaking in the gospel of Matthew. And uh, someone approaches him and says, uh, what's the most important commandment? So we're on the terrain of ethics. And Jesus replies and says this, many of you perhaps have heard this, teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment, the primary commandment. And then a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This to me is the heartbeat of a Christian ethic. And you can see, I, I want us to note a couple things that, that are reflected in this. First of all, I want you to notice that for Jesus, the articulation of a Christian ethic as we receive it is actually a re-articulation of a Jewish ethic. So it's not an accident that Jesus invokes Israel's what we sometimes call the Shema of Deuteronomy chapter six. This is this is sort of like the credo of Israel. And one of the themes that we could talk about is, I would say, the deep continuity between Israel's ethic uh, and a Christian ethic, and therefore some overlap and, and uh, uh, conversation to be had between Jewish ethics and Christian ethics. Um, that's, that's a first theme to note. But the second thing I want us to um, uh, appreciate is that this vision for ethics of love means that ethics is rooted in what I want to call communion. The heart of ethical vision here is communion. It's communion of human beings with the creator, but it is also our communion with creation, with other creatures, with other humans, with other image bearers, but also the wider cosmos. So this sense that ethics is rooted in love means that ethics is all about how we commune with God and the world that God has made. And so in that sense, ethics is, I want to use a couple phrases. I want to say that ethics is ecstatic. It is uh, it is. It takes us outside of ourself. It pulls us outside of our self-interest and into a wider range of communion. Or another way of saying it, eth ethics is ecstatic or it is other regarding. It, it is priming us to be attentive and attuned to what is other. To God as the ultimate other, but then to all of the other others that we share a world with and to love them, to love God and to love our neighbor and to love creation is in a sense to be attentive and caring about that. But I actually wanna, the, the, the first theme I wanna focus on is that love here, and this might be especially important given our cultural kind of defaults, love here is not just an emotion. Okay. It's not just a feeling and it's not even just a matter of affection or attraction or something like that. Love here, I think, is primarily the language of devotion. To love God and to love the neighbor is to say that we are called to devote ourselves to God and the neighbor, which is another way of saying that we are sort of called to give ourselves away to 
God and the neighbor. Again, that's that ecstatic theme. We are, we're being asked to be pulled out of ourselves in order to attend to, to be attuned to, to be devoted to the other, to God and to neighbor. Now, one of the things I want to talk about is why ultimately in a Christian ethic, love and happiness are not in competition, but we'll see if we can get to that uh, um, before uh, the end of, of this evening. Second theme. So first of all, the heart of a Christian ethic is love, and that it's particularly this call to love as a form of devotion, of care, of attention. The second is, I want to say, I'm going to call this the law of love, which is that we are called to then order our devotion to order our loves. And this is where, instead of going back to the scriptures, I want to go back to what someone we describe as a church father, one of the uh, uh, sort of core Christian doctors of the church named St. Augustine. St. Augustine is kind of my homeboy. Look, this is, he's my, he's, he's my best friend from the ancient world. And I want to, some of you will be familiar with this quote from St. Augustine. Um, This is from his confessions. You have made us, so the confessions are written as sort of a prayer. And he says to God, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. You have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. The reason why we're talking about this here is because for Augustine, the heart is the seat of our loves. The, it is the heart is like the biblical language for the engine room of our desires, of our longings, our hungers, our devotions. And what Augustine is saying is we are made in such a way that there's kind of a design in place where human hearts are made to be devoted. We can't not love something, but they are designed to find the fullness and end of that devotion in the God who created them. So there's, there's a sense in which the human heart is hungry. That, that's a, do you guys know Bruce Springsteen? Everybody's got a hungry heart. That is a very, very Augustinian idea. Okay. That everybody's got a hungry heart. And what Augustine would say is, uh, um, Uh, To be human is to love and is to love something as ultimate, is to give yourself away to something. The key question that you have to ask yourself in this ethic is, what are you going to give yourself away to? Who are you going to give yourself away to? And what Augustine says is, because the human heart is made for the infinite, if we give ourselves away to anything else as if it could make us ultimately fulfilled, if we give ourselves away to creatures instead of the creator, then we are going to be characterized by what he calls this restlessness, this angst, this, this anxiety. It doesn't work. So when I say that uh, um, an ethic of love is about the right order of love, it means a few things. First of all, I I really believe it's important to appreciate that Christian ethics is not primarily about conformity to rules. It's not, what makes one ethical is not that you check the right boxes necessarily. It's not, it's not explained fundamentally as conformity to rules. Rather, I think the heart of a Christian ethic, what, what makes for a well lived life a well-ordered life is a life for whom the order of my devotions fits this design plan so that I find my flourishing in it. And in this sense, uh, um, Augustine's idea in particular, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. It's really an ethic that is sort of an anti-idolatry critique. Now, let me explain what I mean by idolatry, because I, I don't mean like finger wagging, kind of like, oh, you idolaters. For, for Augustine, idolatry is kind of a diagnostic tool where I know that I am idolizing something. I know that my love is wrongly ordered, is disordered. If in fact, I am giving myself away, I am devoting myself to something created as if it was God, as if it was infinite. 
I am giving myself away to, I'm devoting, I'm chasing, I'm sort of consumed by something finite as if it could fulfill an infinite longing. And what Augustine says is what's wrong with idolatry it's not just that it like breaks the law or violates the rules or you know runs uh, runs askew of the first commandment it's that idolatry disordered love is like self destructive it's it's uh, it's a recipe for just incessant dissatisfaction and disappointment or what augustine calls restlessness a lack of peace and I, I have to say, I do think that this is a very powerful diagnostic tool for making sense of a lot of our culture's dis-ease. I, I, think, I think so many of us have loves that are, well, we're kind of looking for love in all the wrong places. And we're, we're devoting ourselves to penultimate things, less than ultimate things, as if they were ultimate. And that could be money it could be power it could be sex it could be politics it could be whatever we we sort of glom on to finite things that aren't bad enough themselves but we foist these infinite expectations upon them and augustine's diagnosis is the reason why that is a wrongly ordered love is not just because it like breaks the law it's because it runs against the grain of the universe. It's because it goes against that design, he says, where the human heart is made for the infant. So rightly ordered love then, what, what Augustine calls ordo amoris, rightly ordered love is, is, first of all, is a right relationship to God. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength devote yourself to the one infinite creature who could actually satisfy your infinite longing. But then that rightly ordered love also translates into, if you will, a kind of horizontal right order, where now I relate to the rest of creation and my fellow creatures as gifts whom God gives me to enjoy, right? Not a disordered love sort of clings to created things as if they were ends in themselves. Uh, it, we sort of over expect from the finite. And that's why this disordered love becomes dominated by a logic of scarcity. Uh, it leads to violence. It leads to exclusion. There's not enough to go around. This is for me. I need it. Whereas Augustine says, when you devote yourself to the God who is infinite, who is the creator of all of the cosmos, in a sense, you get all of the cosmos back now as gift that is given for our um, joy, for our, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, enjoyment actually is the technical term that Augustine used. So love is devotion. We're called to love God, not just because God is some sort of like jealous being who's like, hey, it's about me. It's rather because God has made the human heart and soul to only find satisfaction in the infinite. So it's really an invitation. The command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and all your mind is actually an invitation for the human soul to find the satisfaction that it's made for. That's why the law, the, the law of love is this right order of love. And then the third theme I want to talk about, and, and maybe... Um, Nathan, I'm doing a terrible job of watching the clock, but I'll, I'm hopefully tracking here. Um, I want to talk about love as a habit. This is why I think a Christian ethic is a virtue ethic. So let me explain what I mean. Um, Christian ethics isn't, as I've said, just about obeying a command or following a rule. I'm not saying that there aren't commands and there aren't rules. What I'm saying is what makes action ethical, what makes a way of life ethical, is not just that it is rule conforming. In fact, I would even say in a Christian ethic, we don't even primarily sort of focus on discrete actions and decisions. Let me put it this way. For Christian ethics, the primary question isn't, what should I do? For Christian ethics, the primary question is, what kind of person should I become? And if any of you have been part of the uh, Aristotle conversation, 
that uh, Nathan has hosted before, you should hear some resonance between this. What, what we're talking about is the formation of character. Now, how does this fit together? Well, because love in this picture is not just, we've said it's not an emotion, it's not a feeling, it's not just an affection, it's a, it is not even just a decision. Love is a habit. Now, what do we mean when we say that love is a habit? What we mean is that love becomes a kind of disposition that gets woven into my character such that now it's not just that I am the kind of person who chooses to follow a rule, rather I am the kind of person for whom such loving action kind of bubbles up from below. It's now so woven into the fabric of my being, of my character, that it's not just I think I should do this kind of thing. It's that I am the kind of person who couldn't not do this sort of thing. That is the ideal of ethical formation here, is that love becomes so woven into the fabric of my being and in my character that in a sense, it's a habit because I do it without thinking about it. A habit is, we're not talking about instinct, by the way. We're not talking about biological hardwiring. We're talking about the kind of acquisition of a disposition of character that has been formed in us in such a way that now it comes naturally to us. In fact, sometimes we call such habits second nature. The name for good moral habits is, we call them virtues, virtues. You can probably guess the name for bad moral habits, right? vices, right? So love is a virtue. Let me, let me show you an example of this. Again, I wanna, hopefully this is a framework to see, for those of you who might be familiar with the Bible, this is a framework for seeing the, Christ, the seeing the scriptures in a new way. This is from Paul's letter to the Colossians in uh, chapter three. He says this, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Oh, that more Christians look like that. <laughs> uh, uh, bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against one another, forgive each other. You're hearing all of these virtues that are being described, just as the Lord has forgiven you. But then key verse is verse 14. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. This is a translation we call the New Revised Standard Version. In the New International Version, another uh, uh, translation, verse 14 is translated as, over all these things, put on love, which is the virtue that binds all of these things together, right? Love is the crowning habit trait, is the ordering and organizing habit disposition that then actually orders all of the other practices, all, oh, sorry, all of the other virtues, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness. So if I am going to learn to love, I actually need to learn how to clothe myself with the virtue of love or charity is sometimes an ancient uh, way of describing that. Now, one free footnote here. If you continue in this passage in, in verses 16 and following, it actually gives you a signal of how you learn to put on this virtue. Because Paul continues, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. For those who are Christian, you hear verse 16 and you say, oh, that sounds like church, right? Sounds like going to church. Well, what does, what does that have to do with what he's just been talking about, about putting on love, of putting on this virtue of love? The way we learn these dispositions and practices sorry, the way we learn these habits and dispositions is by practicing them. And so why is worship, for example, important to the Christian life? Why is church, the things we do at church, important to a Christian ethic? Not because we go to earn credit with God, but rather because those practices of the community 
of Christ are the rhythms and rituals and routines by which these uh, dispositions are formed in us. Does that make sense? So that think of, think of uh, um, in a sense, the church, the practices, the rituals and routines of the body of Christ, as we describe the church, are kind of the gymnasium where the heart is training to learn how to love rightly. Okay. Um, how am I doing, Nathan? Do I have like three more minutes? Five You're minutes. doing great. Now, don't worry about the time. Great. Great. So love becomes a habit, becomes inscribed in the character of who I am through these rhythms and rituals and routines and practices. These aren't legalistic performances of trying to get credit with God. They are actually what in a lot of historic forms of Christianity, we call sacraments, which are means of grace by which God is transforming. Now, I would also say the other way that we learn habits, the other way that we acquire virtues is uh, one way is through practice. The other is, and this is an Aristotelian idea, through imitation of exemplars. So, for example, Aristotle, you, you might have talked about this in previous weeks, but Aristotle would say, one of the ways I learn how to be just is by imitating the just man, imitating the just person. That's how I start to sort of practice my way into becoming a just person. That's also really integral to a Christian ethic. It's, it's one of the reasons why, like, stained glass <laughs> is part of the environment of Christian worship. It's why saints are held up as exemplars to imitate. It's why Paul says, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. That's all about virtue formation. Mike. But it's also why, honestly, uh, um, many of us are sort of inspired to a Christian ethic because we see the sacrificial love of a Martin Luther King or a Dorothy Day, or we see just this like oozing compassion of Mr. Rogers, who was a good Presbyterian minister. There's, there's all of that is like picturing something for us. So I want to introduce you to this one kind of cool and crazy idea that comes from St. Augustine that's related to this point. And uh, it's a very, very puzzling quote. Um, but if we can understand this, I think you'll really um, get something of what we mean by character and by the virtues. Uh, let's see. I want to go to the next quote. Here we go. Has it, have any of you ever heard this? This is from a little sermon that Augustine preached. It's kind of a famous line. He says this, love and do what you will. Love and do what you want. Now, that might sound like uh, relativism. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, well, as long as you have warm, fuzzy feelings in your heart, you can do whatever you want. That's, that's actually not what Augustine means. What he means is, if your love is rightly ordered, then what you do is going to flow out of that. So as long as you are attuned to and curating your heart, if you will, as long as we are practicing our way into rightly ordered love, our doing, our actions flow out of the heart, flow out of our love. So if we want to act ethically, what the most important thing that we can do is actually attend to the formations of our loves. If we do that, then in a sense, ethical action, Christ imitating action will naturally bubble up from the heart that has been shaped in that way. So love and do what you will. It's a really, really, really provocative uh, um, way to think about what we're talking about. Okay, last theme, because I want to make sure we have time for, for questions with you all. This all sounds wonderful, an ethic of love, it's, warm and fuzzy. I hope I've shown that it's not that, but it, it can sound, I suppose, a little um, idealistic or it could sound a little mushy. Let's, let's make this concrete. I want to suggest that a Christian ethic of love is also a cruciform ethic. Now, what, why? Because what we have to ask, and this is, this is integral to a Christian ethic, what does love require 
in a fallen world? What does love require in a broken world? What does love require in an unjust world? And, and, and I, I would really like to emphasize, and if we, if we had, this, this would be another talk, <laughs> um, but uh, I think one of the things that really distinguishes a Christian ethic, and I would say, by the way, Christianity, is a particular attunement to history, to finitude, and to fallenness. So that what love requires of us is not static. And in particular, we, are, we need to think about what does it look like to live out an ethic of love in a world that's not paradise, that's not ideal, but a world that is ruptured and broken and fallen. And this is where uh, I think we have to point to the Christ-like exemplar. And uh, let me give you one last passage to share with you here. This is... Um, from Philippians chapter two. So Paul's letter to the Philippians. This might be familiar to some of you. If there's any, and I know it's a little long, but this is, this is gold. This is like really sort of the heart of incarnational Christian ethics. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourself. See, there's that other directedness, right? Devoting oneself to the other. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interests of others. And what is the exemplar that we are imitating? Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited or grasped or held onto, but rather emptied himself. The Greek word here is the word kenosis, which from which you, some of you might've heard of the notion of a kenotic. It means to empty, to this is what is distinctive about the God that we meet in the incarnation of God in Christ, that this is a God who actually is also willing to give himself away, to empty himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This holy week, as we describe it as Christians, is also the week of Christ's passion. Christ's suffering, not just his devotion that led to a suffering. And it's precisely because he was devoted to humanity that in a way that ethic of love had to find itself in the translation to humility, suffering, even this, what I'm calling a cruciform shape to what it looked like to be devoted to us. So in, in, in a fallen world, love will sometimes have to look cruciform. It will be sacrificed for the sake of the other or for the whole. Now, we may experience a tension between love and happiness, but that tension is because sin and fallenness and injustice rob us of the conditions for happiness. And sometimes ethical labor will mean sacrificing happiness for myself or ourselves for the sake of writing those conditions. It will be redemptive work because we are actually giving ourselves away with the hope of reconciling, communing, writing the wrong that, that the world uh, is experiencing. Um, we could also talk about how I think love, a love ethic is dynamic. It's, it's, it has to respond to different times and contexts and it requires different responses of devotion depending on where we are and when we are. But, uh, um, uh, I think I should stop there so that we make sure we have time for questions. Does that sound okay? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Jamie, for, for sharing your time with us, for speaking with us, um, for providing this excellent clarity. I appreciate that. Um, and, you know, we opened up the time for you to submit questions, uh, all of you listeners out there. Um, but I'd like to ask my own to start this out, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. It's so interesting to see your presentation of Christianity um, 
and to see how it fits within other ethical systems. So, so many, really the whole ethical enterprise is, is very rational. It's, it's very much uh, an exercise of um, clear thinking, ordering experience, testing what works, what doesn't work, um, practicing. But, but there's a, a rational element to it. And, and much of it is, many of the ethical schools of thought um, deal with enlightenment. Yeah. And in some of your works, you focus on this very important distinction between um, loving and knowing. Can you tell us more about this shift between know in order to love to love in order to know? Yes, what is the, yes. What's the primacy of, of values and, and core values? Yeah, this is, it's a great question, by the way. So you're right that so many ethical systems, I think you said you had a uh, talk on Kant recently. Uh, I just taught Immanuel Kant. Um, what I would say is so many ethical systems kind of overestimate how rational we are. <laughs> now, I'm a philosopher. I literally get paid to think. I am very pro-rationality of thinking. However, I think philosophers are especially prone to overestimate how much our being and doing in the world is the outcome of rational deliberative processes. In fact, we know that that's not true at all. That in fact, this is, this is where cognitive psychology, uh, um, thinking fast and slow, uh, Tversky and, and Kahneman and so on and so forth have shown us that, look, most of our being and doing and, and acting doesn't isn't the outcome of cognitive, rational, deliberative choices and conclusions that we reach. It bubbles up from our habits, our dispositions, our inclinations. Most of our doing, um, even when we do unethical things, it's almost never because we thought about it and made the choice to do the unethical thing. Rather, it's because we have been malformed or unformed or inadequately formed and so our dispositions and habits are vices that incline us in a certain direction now do we want to be people who can reflect on those dynamics and understand them and think about how we act absolutely but the whole point of engage but it's what we're doing tonight right we're sort of stepping into this reflective moment and we're thinking about what we do but the whole point of that is to actually then prime us to become more attentive to the practices that we give ourselves over to, because in many ways, those practices are curating our hearts to have dispositions uh, in one direction or another. And, and we might not always realize uh, how much we're letting disordered practices curate our hearts to disordered love. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, I think your work and your treatment of, of St. Augustine is, is so instructive here. Um, the whole arc of his life is just so fascinating because it's a it, it's a tale of a person who uh, was so exuberant and full of all kinds of passion, whether it's the intellect, speaking, rhetoric, you know, sexual pleasure, um, the gladiators, uh, um, the theater. I mean, Rome was just a smorgasbord of all of these pleasures, and he had his he, he had his fill of all of that and he was left so empty yes what did he do after that what did he what was what was that an epiphany of yeah it's interesting um what it's such a good illustration of his insight then that he has later which is in a way augustine experienced profound disappointment and malaise precisely because he got everything he wanted do you know what I mean? So, so Augustine's disappointments, his restlessness, his anxiety that he experiences, this is especially through his 20s. Uh, um, you know, he's chasing, he's looking for love in all the wrong places. He's looking for this happiness and all of these substitutes for God. And it's not like they didn't work. I mean, he got everything. He, he got professional success. He got sexual conquest. He got you know, uh, uh, um, entertainment that he was looking for. He, he made it to the emperor's court. He got everything he was looking for. And it was still the emptiness of that acquisition 
that became the portal to his being open to realizing, oh, no, I need something qualitatively different. I need to be open to a God who is infinite, not some other new finite thing that's shiny and bright. And um, interestingly, I would say this is this. I don't I don't know if we have time to talk about this, but Augustine experienced his inability to achieve you know true rest and peace because as a what we today would call an addiction augustine realized that in a sense his his he was an addict for certain kinds of pleasure and feedback and he realized that the addictions didn't satisfy anymore but he also couldn't break out of the addiction by himself it's actually very very interesting the the big book of um uh, uh, for Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, one of the key por- parts you have to get to is you have to recognize the need for a higher power. Why? Because you you have to realize that actually you can't get, you can't think your way out of your addiction. And you need to sort of become dependent in a way. For Augustine, that was the experience of receiving grace. Grace is really the ultimate liberation here. I'm, I'm a little worried that I didn't talk enough about grace in a Christian ethic. Well, we have about 15 or 20 more minutes, so um, submit your questions. Yeah, I, I, so if I, if I can piggyback on that then. Um, yeah. there's, there, it's really, really crucial in a Christian ethic that on the one hand, I'm saying love is the center and heart of that. And that love is a kind of devotion to an infinite God who then... Uh, um, calls us to be devoted and attentive to all of God's creatures uh, in a way that is caring for them. It's, it's equally important, I guess, in a Christian ethic to say that that's never something I can accomplish under my own power. That, that, that at least in, his, in historic Christianity, and, and the Christianity in particular that Augustine has been most influential in, Grace is the language we use for our need and dependence on a capacity that comes to us from God. And that too is a gift. And so there's a sense in which um, my ability to become this kind of person is not a spiritual self-help project. It's not, it's not another mode of self-management. There is, there is something about my making myself available uh, to uh, God's incursion um, and renewal that ma- that deepens my capacity for love. I can't pull this off on my own. Mm. And there's a tendency to think that if if we can't do it all on our own, then somehow we're deficient. Or if it's not our own, then it's it's not something that we can have power over. But or that we might we might lose ourselves by opening ourselves up mm, but i mm. guess the, the the message of of saint augustine is that you only gain you don't lose by losing yourself it's it's a paradox you know it is it is a paradox you're right so you actually i have to get to the point i have to come to the end of myself i have to reach the end of myself to really be in a place to make myself available to god and to then the, the, the grace of God that floods in. But Augustine would say, you're right, because that's a fair concern. Augustine would say, that's not robbing me of my identity. It's actually finally congealing my identity. It's finally, God's grace helps me realize who I am in my particularity. And it is the renewal of my agency of my ability to make good choices, of my ability to live into a way of life. So that in a sense, in losing yourself, you find yourself. But you, you, in losing yourself, you find the self that God gives you as an act of grace. And it turns out that was who he made you to be all along. Would you say that something like all human roads terminate before the, the one gate of God? The one, the one I mean, I do, I, I do think that actually um, the path to human flourishing is actually recognizing the limits of human capacity 
And at that frontier is the God who made us and who is always offering and extending grace. So that, yes, I think there's, and I, I think one of the, uh, uh, honestly, I think that's partly why, I, I don't want to get too um, controversial, but I, I think one of the reasons why a secularized culture is so utterly exhausted and anxious and fearful is because in a way we there's something about the dynamics of secularization that make it harder for us to get to that frontier and getting to the end of ourselves. It, right. If you, if you, if you imagine, I'm, I'm speaking very broad strokes here, but if you imagine that in a secularized culture, basically we're all we've got and this is all there is. And if that were the case, if we're all we've got, and this is all there is coming to the end of ourselves would just be, coming to the end <laughs> I mean, like it would be on the other side of that is is oblivion it's abyss this is kind of albert camus this is this is sort of you know albert camus very much lives right on the edge of this sort of reality but if you if you um can find a space in the imagination to say well wait a second what if actually all of this is held together in a god who has made it all and it's available and present and to it, then in a sense to come to the end of yourself is actually to discover the transcendent. And um, I, I, I honestly think that um, I teach at a college, university students, uh, it is an epidemic of mental health. Uh, that that student across the country, every every student life division at every university will tell you this, and the depression, anxiety, fear that that is besetting these young people, I think, is because of the world we've made for them, that has in a sense insulated them from this kind of availability to God, and it's put so much on us. We have to figure it out. We are our own self. We are our own saviors. Um, we're going to have to sort of push through that experience of disappointment to then actually find the dawn of a new availability to God's grace. And the God who's waiting there is not shaking his finger, right? The God who's waiting there is the father of prodigals who's been running to the end of the lane looking every single day. And um, it's, it's one of the reasons why I think you mentioned earlier on these kinds of questions, uh, as a Christian, I find all kinds of concert and sympathy with folks from other religious traditions as well, because on these, you know, you know we might disagree about the particulars, but on the general sense that uh, um, the world needs to be opened up to the God who is beyond it, I think that we share in common. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you say that um, college students who suffer from whatever form of malaise it might be, depression, anxiety, meaninglessness. Do you think that religious people are also subject to that kind of? That's, that's, that, that's I mean, the, it's just demonstrably true. I teach at a Christian university and uh, uh, it's, it's just interesting that, and here's how I, here's how I would explain that. If I ask, those young people, what do they believe? They will tell me all the right answers. The question is, what story do they carry in their bones? What, what, what narrative is actually sort of governing their hearts? And in that sense, uh, they, have, they have been more catechized, trained by cultural narratives that contribute to their despair than their, their churches that might have been, in a sense, sending the right messages to their heads, but haven't actually adequately uh, um, enacted that story in their bones. And I, I think that's where young people feel caught. Well, not just young people, <laughs> old people. <laughs> you know what I mean, I, I, think, I think that is the tension that, that we experience. And um, 
in a in a way augustine was very attuned to the way that we can become sort of fractured selves right like we there's sort of two of me in here because i'm i'm subject to competing formations of my heart all the time and so i kind of i can i contain multitudes as it were and it's probably part of the lifelong journey it's just that i also think that there are clearly cultural trends that contribute to this in some times more than others or some places more than others and i think late modernity um is just a particularly intense experience of um the claustrophobia of of a of a, a kind of secularized sense of the cosmos and um we think of it as an accomplishment but i think we're starting to see that the evidence is that it's maybe we thought the enlightenment liberated us uh, it might turn out that we are sort of our own jailers <laughs> do you know what i mean like we've we've maybe created our own prison in this regard and the the image you give of claustrophobia is, is instructive i think because the the inverse is also true i think which is secular the the vast field of, of secular freedom all kinds of options available to us for for belief um can also be a kind of dissolution where where um we flatten out in a in a world of too much space, too much freedom, and we become dissolved. Very much interesting double image. That, Very know. much, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, let me get to the some, question. Oh, yeah, great. No, no, no. I see some questions. Go ahead. Yeah, well, Annalisa asked this question. She's she's a, a faithful listener. She always asks great questions. When Jesus gave the two great commandments, was he setting up a hierarchy? One, then two, or when he declares the second like unto the first? Does he set the two on par with each other? In other words, is it possible to keep one without the other in a true Christian ethic? Are they in competition at all? Great question. Um, I think, I, I, I don't imagine a hierarchy. I think they are a package deal. Um, uh, it's just that I do think it's the distinctive qualitative distinctiveness of the devotion to God that in a sense makes it possible for us to also be the kinds of people who can be love our neighbors. It is interesting. This gets echoed in, in um, the little book of first John at the end of the new Testament, where it, John says, you know, basically don't tell me you love God. If you hate your neighbor, right? What you do to your neighbor is actually a barometer of whether or not I should really believe that you love God. So I, I think that the two are very much integral. And um, uh, it's one of the reasons why, you know, think of in Matthew chapter 25, there's this, this parable of the sheep and the goats and people, uh, so to speak, get to heaven. And Jesus says, you know, get away from me. I don't even know who you are. And they're saying, well, wait a second. I, we believed in you and we said this about you. Yeah, but you didn't care for the least of these. You didn't attend to the vulnerable. And that is a signal of whether you really loved me. Now, Yuki Whiteley asks the question, are there any signs that a particular love is disordered or malformed apart from an internal sense of dissatisfaction? On my read, the, the dissatisfaction is the disappointment, the failure of it to be able to be realized is kind of the primary diagnostic for St. Augustine. Um, I think Augustine would also say, okay, we could articulate a sort of normative ideal here, which is he, he uses this language. We should love God. We should enjoy God and use creation. So one of the ways to know whether you are have disordered love, Augustine would say, is if you are trying to enjoy the creation as if it were an end in itself. So I suppose whenever you treat some facet of the creation as a substitute for the creator, you know that you're engaged in disordered love. Uh, that would be the objective way of evaluating it. It's just that he also then thinks that way of relating to creation is doomed to disappointment. And, you know, the question naturally arises, can someone be happy and can someone have character? Can someone be content and at peace 
without consciously accepting the grace of Christ or the, or the, the gifts of God? And if so, are they, are they kind of obeying some underlying invisible order that, that we don't really <laughs> have full articulation of? Yeah, so um, it's a tough question. It's, uh, I think, um, Augustine, and I, I think I agree with Augustine on this. The question would be whether such a love could be sustained without the renewing power of grace and what Augustine would call the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So I think you're right. I, I, I think you could imagine forms of life that are characterized by this kind of devotion um, without their being indexed in, in particular to a Christian faith. I think Augustine would just say it, there will be concerns or questions about how sustainable that is if it's not ultimately underwritten by the um, capacity building of, of grace and the spirit. Uh, because then if we're doing it under our own power, I think that's a big part of what he thinks is the sort of unsustainable piece. That's, that's an inadequate answer, but that's sort of off the top of my head. I think your metaphor, you know, your book On the Road with St. Augustine provides all kinds of great metaphors to, to draw from. And I think the idea of, you know, human beings have a tank of gas and they're traveling with their, their tank of gas, but it's all going to run out eventually unless it gets refueled with everlasting, you know, supply of some sort. Yeah. Would you put that in your book? That might be. A good no, but that's a, yeah. I owe you a footnote <laughs> now. It's great. Uh, well, so Felipe uh, Duarte has asked the question, can we say that the arts have a powerful formative method since, since it can show better how we should be? Oh yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, so yes, I think, let's maybe maybe the way to map it on to what we were talking about is to say i do think at least the arts are one of the most powerful modes of expressing a vision that we would want to imitate right so if you think of one of the ways that i learn the virtues is i see imitation I see exemplars that I want to imitate. I do think one of the things that happens in the arts is that they can be, because of the power of story, because of the power of character, for example, we'd have to get more specific about film or fiction or whatever it might be, but often because of those dynamics of how art works on the imagination, they can invoke a picture that, that sort of models for me what a well-ordered life looks like. And uh, in that sense, they sort of have a drawing power. The other thing I would say is I also think the arts are particularly equipped or are particularly adept at training me to be attuned and attentive to the particularities of others. Do you know what I mean? Like for me, a novel, especially like a novel after French novelists like, like Flaubert or Proust, a novel is basically a... Um, it's a machine for getting in someone else's head. Do you know what I mean? Like the, but my, but my favorite novels are not like sort of mystery page turners. My favorite novel is the, the novel where like maybe two things happen in the whole story, but I am living in somebody else's head and I'm learning to experience the world the way they experience it. And in so doing, in a way, I am also learning how to be attentive to my neighbor in all of their complexity and mystery and depth and profundity. It's all like, it like reminds me that, oh my gosh, every single human being is this like mysterious profundity walking beside me that deserves my attention, that deserves my care. And I, I think the arts are really a beautiful way to, to do that. Name three or four of your favorite um, expressions of literary art or cinematic art. <sighs> Uh, okay, so how about um, uh, Terrence Malick's film, Thin Red Line? The, the war movie is to me a stunning meditation on the brokenness and beauty of the cosmos. Absolutely love it. Um, the poetry of Ted Hughes, a British poet, is to me uh, such a marvelous attention to nature. He's from, from North Yorkshire. Um, 
who else? Um, yeah, one of um, uh, the short stories of Flannery O'Connor are, are really, really great exercises in appreciating all the messed up beauty of the people that we inhabit this planet with. I think that's a great way to sort of apprentice your imagination. Um, and the music of the Avid Brothers, to me, is sung theology. Uh, it's a really, they, they get at confession, brokenness, longing, um, beauty, joy. Yeah, those are a few examples. Oh, thanks. That's a, a list that I, I wouldn't have wouldn't have come up with. That. That's the half the fun, yeah. right? We all have different lists. We sure. all have different lists. Yeah. I thought you were going to say The Tree of Life by Terrence Malick. No, see, so I, of course, I mean, you, we could have actually talked about a lot. Uh, um, uh, but but to me, Thin Red Line is this unbelievable movie. I also just recently, uh, Paul Schrader's latest movie, Card Counter, with Oscar Isaac, is a very Pascalian and Augustinian film. It's really with a with an amazing soundtrack. Well, I have to look at that. For Great those of you who are interested in the arts, subscribe to image journal mm. Mm. <laughs> but yeah this is this is exactly why i'm involved with images because i actually think the art i'm a philosopher i'm i believe in arguments but i also think the arts sort of tap into that heart that augustine is talking about mm. yeah and you mentioned in your in your book you are what you love how it really is the heart that is the the, the central um spiritual and religious an ethical, you know, organ or, you know, mode of understanding or yeah, living. Yeah. 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 Hunger Which is, is actually the, the most basic. Yeah, exactly. Desire. It's, it's, it's exactly why for me, love, desire, longing, hunger, those are actually all synonyms. Mm -hmm. They're all expressing. And that's why I think this language of devotion, what am I giving myself over to? What am I giving myself away to? What am I hoping for, longing for? Um, I think that's what love is trying to capture. Yeah. So previously there was a question by um, Stefan Gozali. He raised his hand. I think he may have tapped out. Oh, okay. he, he never typed it in. So if you, if you come back, we'll entertain your question. Um, any more questions out there? I always have a, a whole bunch of questions. One that I had, and it concerns St. Augustine, and it concerns the, the quote that you read, and, and this is what Augustine opens his confessions with. It's basically, he, he characterizes his life as, a, as a, an unending stream of restlessness, which is, I think, a form of suffering. Um, but is, you know, and, and he characterizes... Mm. God as his final rest, must there be um, must there be a final rest or can is it possible for the human soul to thrive in perpetual movement? Does that make um, sense? Yes, let's let's distinguish um, part of me wants to distinguish movement from restlessness because I don't think rest, is the same as being static. So think of the, so the contrasting terms here are slightly different. I think restlessness is angst, unsettledness, a churn that will never allow us to have peace. Rest, actually, interestingly, rest and peace are synonyms for Augustine. Rest and peace are, are basically mean the same thing for him. So the soul's longing is to find rest, which is to find peace, which is in a way to be found, to, to be caught up in something that finally the God who holds me. And uh, um, it's why he also associates this with Sabbath. He thinks the whole end of the arc of human history is a longing for a Sabbath. But that Sabbath is not um, the end of movement. It's rather moving into a kind of dynamism that isn't frantically searching 
for false alternatives, right? Now it's a dynamism and a movement that knows where home is, that knows who we are. And, and there's all kinds of room for growth. So it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a really interesting question. And it's, it's fun to, to think through the nuance of this because otherwise what, what Augustine sketches as rest and peace could sound like, really? That's a, this, and and uh, in fact, what he means is a liberation from franticness. <laughs> um, but then you can sort of have a gifted movement, a gifted dynamism. I, I'm speaking a bit too abstractly, but that probably makes sense. No, this is great. Well, let me just end with a quote from your book, You Are What You Love. It's page 15. And, I, and it just struck me as being simple, but yet it, it very makes you think. To be human is to be a lover and to love something ultimate. And just, just ponder that, you know, what, what are the ultimate things? Is there, is there one ultimate thing? And, you know, and how do we love that thing that we may not be able to see, we just have a sense for? Those are my questions that always stay with me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and these are, these, are, these are the questions worth asking, right? These are, these are the questions worth contemplating and discussing. And we don't have to get to the end of our questioning uh, to be pursuing that good together in concert, which is, which is exactly what you're fostering here, Nathan. It's been really lovely. Thanks. And before we end, I must show the audience this Great. book. On the road with Saint Augustine is is amazing. So is this. You are what you love. Um, Thank you. Two books, and of course, everyone must know it's, this. It's a wonderful that great. That I've really come to warm to that new translation. It's oh, really? really great. It yeah. is different. Yeah. 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 I actually happened to listen to a, a snippet you did with the Trinity Forum. Oh yeah. And you you mentioned Sarah Rudin's translation. That's it's great. Yeah, yeah. This is my, uh, this is the one I teach with, which is uh, Chadwick's, uh, this is an older Oxford edition, 1992, so not so old, but you can tell mine is kind of well-worn a little bit. Very well used. Well, let's end there. Um, this, has Very been, much. this has been fun, Jamie. I really appreciate this. Um, I just want you to know that you are you're, you're making a difference out there. You're, you're reaching people that you don't know you're reaching. And you're, mm, mm. Your, um, your work and your speech, your voice is, is entering into people's hearts. So I appreciate that. Keep, thank keep you. That up. And then Felipe says, thank you, Dr. Smith. I've studied some of your works during my MDiv. It was, it was very blended. It's been thank very Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for good questions. I really enjoyed it. Blessings on on uh, this Holy Week for those who observe. Thanks, Thanks. for the opportunity, Nathan. Appreciate okay. it. Okay, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye. Cheers. Bye.